Okay, so now you can hear me. Okay, so I was just talking to myself for five minutes. That's great. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We're back online. Um, this is Parametric Camp. This is Jose Luis. This is our social media. That's the subscribe button, you know, all the typical stuff uh, and the Discord and the uh, Google Calendar to subscribe. It's all in the description. And what are we doing this afternoon? We are continuing with the work that we did this morning, which is we're continuing with the advanced development in Grasshopper playlist. So this morning we did a very long video <laughs> on developing components for nerves geometry. So this afternoon, I have two things that I would like to do. I would like to do, I would like to do a couple things. I would like to introduce the Grasshopper Sharp project. I would like to take the Grasshopper Sharp project. I would like to discuss struct types versus class types. And that's particularly important because in Rhino, they're very mixed. So um, they behave very differently. So I would like to take over that. And then after that, we will move on to the next big section, which is going to be advanced topics in scripting. Maybe they should definitely go here. Uh, OK, I don't know. Anyway. So let me write myself a few notes here. Uh, a few notes here of what are we doing? And then, all right, this afternoon we are going to, hey Jazz, what's up man? Or gal, I'm not sure. So I'm going to, what are we doing today? I'm going to talk about grasshopper sharp. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how to, well, this, this we can probably save and close already. And this I can have here. And then I can probably just, um, I can probably just, um, okay. So I'm going to talk, I would like to introduce this as, um, I'm going to introduce Grasshopper Sharp. This is the video that we're recording now. Grasshopper Sharp as a way of understanding how Grasshopper components work. And the way I'm going to do this is that I'm actually going to talk about how am I going to do this? I'm going to do this the following way. And how am I going to introduce the problem? The problem is <clears throat> there's all these components that are great. I don't probably not, don't, I don't need to use this. And there's this one, subdivide surface, <clears throat> because there is divide surface. Mm hmm. Uh, okay, divide surface. And it took a while. So how do we know how can we make this and how can we learn? And that's how when I introduced the project Grasshopper Sharp. Um, and I show how to, for example, just download a zip file. And the, the download the zip file, we show a bunch of files, etc. And then I discuss, and then I discuss, um, I discuss how to contribute the guidelines. Uh, I discuss how it's mostly done and I would like to do, and I would like to do an event at some point, a release party. And so if that's the case, then there will be links somewhere to that release party, etc, etc. 
Okie dokie. <clears throat> okay, I think we're good. So let's start. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and in this video in the series Advanced Development in Grasshopper, I would like to introduce you to a pet project of mine and some colleagues for the Parametric Camp. Uh, starting over, starting over again. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and I would like to. Uh, <laughs> Starting over again, over again. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series Advanced Development in Grasshopper where I would like to introduce you to a pet project of mine that many of my friends, colleagues, people from the community have helped me build together which um, I hope will be extremely useful for you to learn more and dig deeper into how Grasshopper works and its relationship with RhinoCon. Because the problem is the following. You have seen me in previous videos build a lot of components that replicate functionality that is available in, um, in Grasshopper. Like for example, how to take a curve and subdivide it in equal length segments or how to take a surface and subdivide it in points in the UV direction. And it turns out that um, coincidentally, because Grasshopper tries to be very componentized, very atomic, it coincidentally happens that many of the components just happen to be a straightforward implementations of functions that are available in the Rhino geometry namespace. So for simple things like creating points, creating vectors, etc., it's very simple to find in the documentation where those functions exist. But for more complex operations, sometimes it's actually not so straightforward to figure out what code is actually running inside of the component to perform operations and to yield results that are equal to what the vanilla component actually does. And it turns out that many of those are also not straightforward from, for, from the Rhino common. For, for example, if I want to subdivide a surface like this one, you have seen me in previous videos try to be divide surface and nothing really pops up. There's no method really. Uh, if I do divide curve, there is something divide by comb, divide by length, but um, it's a little tricky. And especially for example, for a surface, there's just nothing right like that. So you saw me on the previous video, actually have to write quite some code already to figure out the uh, a behavior that mirrors the native grasshopper component. So what I have found across these years is that many of us who are very familiar with grasshopper sort of have a difficulty transitioning to a scripting and to building our own plugins just because we know and we're very familiar with the functionality in grasshopper, but we're not really familiar with how that functionality is actually developed using raw Rhino common or just using C sharp scripting inside of Grasshopper. So what is the relation? How can we know in the first place, given a particular Grasshopper component, how can we know the code that is actually powering that component? And how can we learn to mimic that functionality using Rhino common? So what that is exactly what the project that I'm going to introduce you is trying to solve. And the project is called GH Sharp or Grasshopper Sharp, a C Sharp dictionary of Grasshopper 3D components. The idea is that this is an open source that I started now two years ago and, <laughs> and I'm still trying to wrap it up because of course I have like 17 other things to do always. And that has been built 
but it was started as a project in my class in the design school at Harvard and then it just got amplified by many more members by the community and we have had contributions by a lot of people who have gently and very gratefully given their time to the project and what the project is is basically a way to give you an insight about how grasshopper components may actually be developed internally. So what the component does is that it has a, what the, what the project does is that it has a source folder where you can see all the categories that are available in Grasshopper. So for example, you can see we have math, we have sets, we have vectors, we have curves, you have each one of the categories. And inside of these categories, so for example, if I go to surface, you can see that for surface I have analysis, I have freeform, I have primitive, and we don't have sub D because this was pre Rhino 7. We have utils, etc. So we have a file, we have a grasshopper file that mimics each one of the categories that we can unfold. So, and then inside of each one of those files, there are lists of C sharp script components that have code that is trying to mirror the functionality of the original component. So how can I actually read these files? Well, the way to access these files is you go to the GitHub repo and I haven't, I don't have a GitHub or Git uh, playlist yet. I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully going doing that very soon. But the way you do this is you go to the GitHub repo, you click on code. And if you're not in GitHub or you're not going to contribute, the easiest thing is just to download all the files in that date. No forking, no PR, unless you know what you're doing. So I'm going to download a zip. I'm just going to save it somewhere on my desktop, for example. And then the file just showed up here. I'm going to extract this to Grasshopper, Sharp, must, Master, something, something. And you can see that the structure of file shows up here. And as I was saying, in the source folder, you have folders for each one of the main tabs. And then inside of them, you have folders, you have files for each one of the categories. So for curves, we have analysis, division, primitive, etc. And what's interesting is that I can just now, for example, go open primitives. And what I can see is that I have a long list of components, just like these ones, also divided. So if you look at primitives, you can see that there's basically four sections, the first one, second one, third one, and the fourth one. So you can see that the components here are arrayed in the same order as in here. So if I zoom in, you can see that the whole project is pairs of vanilla component and C sharp implementation. And you can double click and you can zoom in and you can see the code that is running a version of that component. And you can see that the results are typically compared one after the other. So for example, let's fit a line through a bunch of points. Let's uh, create a line between two planes and then we can double click here and you can see that this actually needs a couple of intersections and finding points and particular elements. And for example, you can see a line from the starting point, the vector and the angle. And you can see that there's actually a constructor that does that right away. And you can see that, for example, how can I do a circle? How can I do a circle from three points? Or if I were to go to surface, utilities, and I can go now to utilities and I can say, what is the code that is running behind, for example, surface frames? Well, it's the second component on top. So it's going to be this one here. So I have surface frames, the original component, and then I have surface frames. And you can see that there is quite some code here to create a data trees, to do some sanity checks and then to create data, double for loop. This code is actually very, very similar to the example that you saw before in the previous video when we were doing NURBS components. It's just that it has more safety checks, more data structure. It's a bit more complex because it's really trying to mimic the functionality of the original component as, soon, as close as possible. Or for example, do I want to know how to create a loft between uh, a bunch of curves? Well, that's going to be surface freeform. So let me open the surface freeform and let me look for uh, in the in the file. Let me look for where is loft. 
loft is here. So you can see that loft, it has a bunch of explanations here. There's something uh, special about this, blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out that actually there's quite some code going on to do the loft thing. Uh, and this is just because doing a simple loft is actually quite straightforward, but mirroring all the options and all the different things that you have in Grasshopper available to you is not so straightforward. So, um, so I, what this project basically is about is giving you C sharp script versions of as many components as possible. And you will notice that the project is not 100% complete. There are some components that are not, the, the output is not exactly as the original, or there are some other components where we really didn't know how to make this happen and we haven't figured it out yet. So we are open to contributions. Or if you can dig, dig, dig in um, or contribute your own version of the component, that's more, we're more than welcome to accept those. But at the core, hopefully it's a very interesting project because it will give you, it gives you an option to find any vanilla grasshopper component. And let's, like for example, for meshes, we have a lot of, we have almost all the vector algebra in the planes, etc. It gives you an option to see for a component that you're already familiar with, to see what code is running inside. And therefore, learn more about what the um, about what is the relation between grasshopper components and rhino common or how to learn functionality from rhino common and apply it in your computational workflows okay so i'm going to be posting a link to this project maybe it's a card it's definitely going to be in the description uh, and again i think that this is a great project if you want to learn more or if there is, or if you're writing a C-sharp script and you know the functionality that you want from Grasshopper, but you don't really know what are the, what's the way of writing that in Rhino terms, okay? So this could be a really good repository for you. We are, most of the components that we wanted to target are already done as of the recording of this video, but we haven't formally published it yet because I want, I mean, I'm, <coughs> I'm right now in the middle of, um, writing a paper that I want to publish to document this work more formally, but also I want to do a launch party with everyone, all the grateful people, all the wonderful people that helped me uh, build this together. I would like to make a launch party and officially throw this out in the world and uh, maybe have a virtual drink and you know, all those things. So if that has happened, there will be also some card popping up somewhere or there might be a link in the description to a video where that um, launch party is happening, okay? But in the meantime, I hope this is going to be useful for you to learn more and um, definitely use this as a way of, of improving your Grasshopper to c -sharp skills, okay? Thank you very much and see you on the next video on this series. Oh, and if you like this video, maybe like it on the button, maybe subscribe to the channel, etc, etc. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Okay. So I need to write myself a note here afternoon. All right, and I and I need to go missing one minute. I have an important call. I'm going to. I'll be by, right back. Just give me one minute. Okay, <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> All right, so.
Okay, so what are we doing next? So we don't need this. Um, we don't need this as of either. This can go. Okay, the, this video, the next video I want to do is I want to show the difference between class types, uh, between struct types and class types. Okay. So, and that's going to be quite important. And for this, I actually want to make an example. So let's say I get a vector. So V and V and that's it, right? And this is going to be, and then this is V1. And this is V2. So what I want to show is this idea. I want to show is this idea. So V vector 3D V1 equals V. And now if I unitize V and I say vector 3D V2 is going to be equal to V, then it turns out that V1 equals V1, V2 equals V2. And <laughs> okay, that's not going to work, obviously. <laughs> and uh, let's say, uh, uh, for example, one, two, and three. Okay, so one vector gets unitized. Okay, so that is logical. And now, for example, let's say I draw a curve. And then I bring the curve inside here. So I take this curve, right? And then the domain of the curve is whatever. Okay, so... And then what I do is I'm going to take this curve and then let's see two. And then I'm going to take this and then this is going to be of the type curve. And then I would like to place this here and also another one here. What I want to do is the following. I want to say curve C1 equals C. C dot domain, I'm going to change the domain to a new interval, 0 and 1. And then curve C2 is going to be equal to C. And now C1 equals C1. And then C2 equals C2. And the, what I believe is going to happen is that both have the same domain because they are classes, exactly. So, mm -hmm. and how could I do? So what I could do is how could I explain this with a diagram? How can I explain that with a diagram? I'm thinking Well, I mean, we could do something like V1 
is pointing to So we have Z, the vector, and this generates X, Y, C, and then V2 basically generates X, Y, and C, and this is a ref this is passed by value. Whereas if I do this, if I do C1 and I do C2 and do C, it turns out that they're both pointing to some memory address like A, 3, F, B, some something, something, something. Um, this is absolutely unintelligible, right? What if I draw a different diagram that looks more like this? So we have V and then what V is giving V1 is given X, Y, and C. And then is given V2 It's also given X, Y, and Z. So this is values. Wow. Which means that V1 has some X, Y, and C. And X, Y has some other X, Y, and C. However, However, in the case of C, what is set to C1 and what is some kind of memory address like A, F, 3, 2, B, C, for example. And then what gets sent to C2 is also the same thing. A, A, F, 3, 2. Should I use my computer? This is just sucking for drawing. And then, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is really bad. No, well, let's not delete it, but Okay, so maybe I need to well, pick up the other computer and all right, find a way to draw this. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Okay. Uh. And then he. 
here I'm going to project to my wireless display, which should be here. Bang. There you go. There you go. Then if I open a sketchbook, the sketchbook shows up here. And here I can draw. Hello, there you go. Now, now you got it. Okay, I was being lazy and not writing things properly. So, okay, so let's do some layers, some as, as we typically do. So let's start. We have We have the vector, okay? And um, and when I create, okay, so we have the vector. And then when I create when I create a copy to V1, what I give it is whatever X, Y, C values it has at that point. And then whenever I create a second copy, for example, for example, here, whenever I create a second copy, what I get is whatever values x, y, and c it had at that point. And I'm actually going to here. All right. What that means is that at the end of the day, <clears throat> the result is that each component ends up, each variable ends up having x1, y1, and c1. And the other ends up having values x2, y2, and c2. Okay, so it's a state-based kind of situation. Whereas the other situation that may happen is the following is that we have a curve okay and then i want to create the first copy of the curve and this is going to be called this is going to be called c1 but what gets passed in this case is not the values of the curve because it's a very complex object but it's what's called a pointer, a reference in memory. So that's like, you know, like A, E, 2, B, C, 3, something, something. All right. And then when I want to create a, <clears throat> and a second copy, for example, and this is going to be C2, what gets passed is the exact same reference a e 1 b 3 6 etc etc so what ends up happening at the end of the day is that both objects are pointing to the same memory address a e 1 b Three, 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 three. And if any changes are made to this, the object that lives in that memory address, um, those ch changes broadcast. So the difference between these two behaviors, um, I'm going to value type and the reference type. Exactly. So. So reference type is a value type. So 
this is called a bad oops this is called a value well that was terrible oh sorry i'm drawing you can see my screen okay so that's called a value type like structs whereas the other behavior this behavior is called a reference reference type and this is what classes do oh <laughs> Okay, I will move my head around. Okay. So, and that's the story that I think I want to tell. Bong, bong. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I have V1. <clears throat> I have the curve and it's got this domain. And I have this domain here and this domain. Oh, sorry, you're still not watching me. Okay, so here you go. Reference type versus type. Okay. All right. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to <clears throat> delete this and I'm going to delete this. Okay, let's do it. Struct types versus class types. Uh, reference, maybe. Referent, reference type versus value types. Reference, maybe classes versus values. And then what else? Difference between classes and values and structs. So can I have the full constructor? Um, can I copy and assign social values with that can be instantiated without using a new operator? A struct cannot inherit from another struct. A struct cannot be a base class. A function members in a struct class. Uh, the interface that can be implemented interface can be used a noble type and can be assigned a null value. Ah, is that true? That's not, that's actually not true. Structs can, are not nullable types, no? Well, you can make them nullable, but they cannot take null types. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the 
Does this versus track? Am I going? Is the is the video going to be about classes versus structures? I think it is going to be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so let's start. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video on the series Advanced Development for Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to go back to the topic of classes versus structures, and I would like to dig deeper, a little deeper into why this difference and in which ways it manifests technically, okay? Because it just so happens that Rhino actually mixes them both. It mixes struct structures as a data for simpler geometry types, points, vectors, circles, that kind of stuff. And it uses classes a lot for more complex data types, such as curves, such as surfaces, B reps, etc. etc. And um, there are a few differences that justify why this uh, classification makes sense. And I would like to touch upon them right now. As we discussed in previous videos, in general, in a very high level way, I would like you to think of structures as lightweight versions of classes. What that means is that structures as a way of representing data are typically used when that data that we're representing is somehow very simple to represent numerically. So for example, vectors is just three numbers, points is just three numbers, a circle is a point and a number. So they're actually quite straightforward simple implementations. And, um, and there are reasons why structures are better for those because of memory, where they're allocated, how fast they are to copy, paste, etc., etc. So that's one thing. Whereas classes are data structures that are typically reserved for more complex data types. So curves have a lot of information, like for example, nerves curves, they have the knots, they have the domain, they have the parameters, they have the control points, they have the weights, they have like a lot of stuff. And that's just curves. So imagine surfaces, which is the same thing in two dimensions, plus trimming information. Then there's B reps, which is collections of surfaces and edges and trimming information. So there's a lot of stuff. So their numerical representation is actually quite complex. And that's why the classes are a better data structure to represent them. But who cares about this? Like, if they were identical, nobody really would care, or for us, it would not be important. Turns out that there's a couple things that on, in the way structures and classes behave, that uh, when we're writing code, if we're not aware of these differences, we may start getting behavior that we don't expect. And that's why I want to record this video in particular. And one of the main differences, perhaps the biggest one between structures and classes, is that structures, are value types, whereas classes are reference types. And what that means is going to be easier to explain if I show you an example of a behavior that might be unexpected. So let's go to Rhino. And in Rhino, I have this um, grasshopper file where I started creating a vector, okay? And I have fed this vector to a C-sharp script component. And this C-sharp script component is going to output two vectors. All right, now the example that I'm going to do is that I'm going to first create a vector. So all the examples that I'm going to be doing are going to be about copying data, all right? Which perhaps is a better way of illustrating this problem. Let me create the first vector that is going to be lowercase v1, all right? Which is going to be a simple copy of the vector that is coming is as an input. So whatever we have in v1, it's just going to be a copy of what came in as an input, right? Now, after we do that copy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the original vector that came in into the uh, component, and I'm going to unitize it, all right? So I'm going to modify the vector that came in, and I'm going to shrink it or extend it 
to make it one unit long. All right, but I'm doing that, remember, after I copied it in the first place. So V1 is before. And then after I unitize the vector, I'm going to copy it a second time. I'm going to create a second copy, V2, and that's going to be vector V after I unitize it, correct? So once I have done, I'm just going to do some outputs here, and I'm going to say the output of the component, capital V, is going to be equal to the variable that I copied here at the beginning, V1. And V2 is going to be equal to that other, that other variable that I declare afterwards. So now here's my question to you. What does your intuition tell you about this vector and this vector? So is this vector V1, is it an unit vector or not? And then is vector 2, is it an unit vector? or not. What do you think? I'm going to give you five seconds to think about this. Tick tock, 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 tick tock. Well, um, we don't need to speculate that much. We can actually see this in real life. So I'm going to hit play. And as you can see, the output of B1 is the same original component, no changes, the same original vector. And the output of V2 is the vector that looks like it's unitized. So actually, if I say, for example, let me make this one vector that is 10 units long and the other one is, you see that this one, the second one is clearly unitized. So we can see that the behavior that we obtain here is very clearly that vector one is a copy of the vector when it was not unitized. We did unitize it afterwards. And then vector two is a copy of the same vector after it was unitized. And that's what we're seeing here, okay? Now, whatever your intuition was, there's no right or wrong here because depending on where you're coming from, this may feel natural because, hey, I copied it when it wasn't, uh, when it wasn't unitized and then I copied it afterwards when it was unitized. So this feels natural to me. But if you're coming from a CS background, maybe this doesn't feel natural to you because we're used to other behaviors. It doesn't matter. So with vectors, this behavior that you have seen is how it works. But now let me show you what would happen if we did a similar operation, but with a curve, which instead of a struct, just like uh, vectors, instead of a struct, a curve is actually a class. So for example, I have a curve that I have brought in from Rhino, and I can see that as we discussed previously, this curve has whatever domain, zero from zero to 20 something something, all right? So what I want to do is I have this component where I can, I'm taking in the curve and I'm going to output two different curves. And I'm going to follow a very similar process. I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to leave this room for outputs here. And I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to copy this curve and I'm going to say lowercase c1 is going to be equal to the curve that is coming in as an input. All right, all good. This feels natural, right? So now after that, I'm going to take the domain of the curve and I'm going to change it to a new interval from zero to one. So I'm kind of reparameterizing the domain of that curve. And then after I do that, I'm going to create a second variable called C2. And that C is going to be a copy of the curve after I have changed the domain of the curve. All right, and now let's see what we get out of here. So you probably see where I'm going with this, right? So what do you think is going to be the outcome of this operation? I'm going to give you another three seconds. Tick tock, 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 tick tock. <laughs> I need I need some sound effects too for for this. Can someone contribute some sound effects for this? So let's see what the result is going to be. If I hit play turns out that the result, the outcome of this component is two curves, both of them being uh, reparameterized, which may seem a little weird. I think I'm on the side where I felt that this was natural when I started learning how to code and I felt that this was odd. And But let's review this. So what is happening here? I did copy C1, I did copy this curve before I changed the domain. 
and then C2, I change, I copied it after I changed the domain. So this one feels natural to me, but this one, it feels like it should have the original domain because when I copied it, it still was not reparameterized. Okay. Again, whether if this feels natural to you or not, doesn't really matter because it is what it is. Okay. Um, now to me, when I first learned how to code, this part, this one was the one that didn't feel natural and the one that I was puzzled about a little bit. And then very soon I learned that the problem or the opportunity here, because this is actually an advantage if you know how to harness this, the problem or the opportunity was that struct types like vectors are types that work, uh, are types that are called value types. Whereas data structure classes, such as for example, curves, are called reference types. And the behavior of how assignment, I was using the word copying, but that's not the, the reality. The behavior of how assignment works, if, he, if it is a value type or if it is a reference type, it's very different. And let me illustrate this with an example to explain what was going on under the hood. So, Let's go to the whiteboard. In the whiteboard, we are going to describe the process that we did before. We have a vector, whatever, V. We started with this vector. And I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy. I'm going to make the first copy of this vector. Okay. And then what happened under the hood is that because vector is a struct and it's a value type, what got assigned, so what got copied were, if you will, all the parameters and all the data that was inside of the vector, but not the vector itself. Give me a second. Give me a second. So what got copied were the values. All right. Now, after I made the first copy, remember, I unitized the vector. And then after I unitized the vector, I made a second copy. At that point, the values, the XYZ values of the vector had changed. And what got copied to the second vector were the updated values of the vector at that point. But again, not the vector itself. So that's why what I ended up with was with vector one with a particular XYZ from before unitization and then a second V2 with another set of particular values after being unitized. Okay, because everything was copied or assigned by values. Now, what is the opposite behavior or what is the difference with what happened when we were working with classes? Well, we have the initial curve, okay? And then what we did was we wanted to make a first copy of the curve. However, because classes are reference types, and this is derived from the fact that classes are more complex, they have more data, lots of numbers, whatever, right? So because classes are more complex structures, when we assign them, when we copy them, when we pass them between functions, what we pass, what we copy, what we assign is not the values that are living inside of the curve. What we're actually passing is what's called a reference to wherever that original curve is living inside of memory. Think of as a pointer, an, an address. So what gets passed is some kind of alphanumeric sequence that just says the original curve is living somewhere in memory. So go there. Whenever you look at C1, just go there and fetch data from that, that, that place. This is because class types, again, because they're more complex, they're typically more heavy, they're typically heavier, they have a bigger memory print. So when we assign them or we copy them to avoid over, over to avoid like memory consumption, etc., what we basically do is we copy a pointer to where they're living in memory. So in this case, as opposed to what we did before, we're not copying the values, but we're copying the object itself, a reference to the same object. And then when after this, what we did was we changed the domain of the original curve. Okay. And then after that, we wanted to create a second copy. And then when that second copy happened, 
it was, it was copied exactly the same as the first one. What was copied was not the values of the new curve with the new domain. No, what was copied was that address, the same address actually, that was pointing to the same place where the original curve lives in memory. The result of this is that now C1 and C2, what they are is that they're not new objects with new information. What they're simply is they are copies of the address, the memory pointer that contains the actual information of the curve. So basically, C, C1 and C2, the three of them are looking at the same memory slot where the information is contained. And that is the reason why after we copied C1, when we made changes to C, when we changed the domain, because C1 is looking at the same place in memory as C, and C2 is also looking at the same place in memory as C, the changes that we made inside of C are now visible and are shared by C1 and C2. Because again, C1 and C2 have no information. What they have is a, an address to where they should go and look for information. What was copied was not the values that represent the curve, but a pointer to where that curve is in memory. That is the difference between reference types, which are what classes are, and value types, which are what the way structs behave. And this is the main difference that we will see when working with, oops, oh, sorry, <laughs> classes here. Um, this is the main difference that we will see when working with structs or with classes, that as we, oops, sorry, that as we copy them or as we assign them to different values, for structs, when we assign, we're basically implicitly copying, copying a new instance with new values, and that, but, and then after that, they become separate entities. Whereas with classes, when we do assignment by reference, what we're basically saying is, can you please make C1 look at the same place as C, as plain C? And can you please make C2 look at the same place as C? and therefore the same as C1. And that's why any change that I make to C after will affect the values of a variable that was declared before C1, which is the part that I found a little counterintuitive when I first started, but over experience and learning, I have now in TVRES, okay? This idea, values versus references, works for assignment, but it also works for function declaration. So when I send a class to a function, the class can change the value of that function. Whereas if I send a struct to a function and the function changes the struct, that those changes will not, um, will not be, will not have effect on the original object. Same thing. All right. There's a few other minor differences. For example, um, Class objects can be null, whereas struct objects, I believe they cannot be null. They have to have a value of initialized. Uh, there are differences about where they are stored in memory, etc. But for us, in practical terms, this is the most important one. The idea that if I copy an object and I modify afterwards, I may modify the original one that I copied beforehand in, in terms of classes. All right. So keep that in mind as you move forward, because this is a topic that may lead to small confusions as you start becoming, as you start writing more and more complex code, all right? And as much as you can, just try to be mindful about what type are you using when you're working with B reps, surfaces, curves, vectors, whatever, just to keep in mind the behavior that you may expect, okay? All right, that was all. That was structures versus classes in the c -sharp programming language and with specific applications here in the world of Rhino Common within Grasshopper. Okay, keep those in mind um, for your, um, for your com com complex um, c -sharp workflows. Okay, uh, okay, let's move on to the next topic in this series. But in the meantime, maybe if this was useful, consider subscribing to this channel, liking this video, uh, leaving a word, etc, etc. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Woohoo!
Ooh, how was that? Hmm? Oops. How was that? Was that clear? All right, let me. Okay. Let me save this file. That's going to be 4.1. Classes versus structs. Hey, Kartik, I didn't know you were here. Hi. All righty. Did I mention a reference to any card of sorts? So, do, 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 uh, do I have a video on the this about structs? Pass construct structs passing by reference versus passing by value. Oh, I actually have an example here. Huh. Uh, all right, so I will add a card to passing by ref versus value and at no particular point. All right. Okay. Hey, go to what's up? All right, let me do a few. I need to do a little bit of refactoring. So now this is going to be number two, three, and then four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight, and nine and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13. All righty. Ah, can I go get some water? I'll be right back. And then we're going to talk about uh, using lists. We're going to talk about using lists as inputs in Grasshopper components, okay? And then the next video after that will be data trees, which is always a, a, a topic of contention. <laughs> let me let me go grab some water and I'll be right back. Give me a second. Okay, I'm back. Ooh, what are we doing today again? Um, I, I, th I don't think I'm going to need 
this anymore. So um, I can probably disconnect. Okay. Boop. All right. I don't think I'm going to need this anymore. So that can go over there. And Okay. So the next thing we have is lists as data inputs okay what's more suitable for development linux windows or mac well well it depends on whatever whatever you're developing if you're developing windows applications <laughs> then it's windows if you're developing cat stuff, that's mostly on Windows as well. If you're developing um, Macs, are really good for development because they're they're bashed. They're, they're basically their whole operating system is based on on, on Linux, so their terminal is um, real Linux. But Macs are really bad for developing anything that is not Mac based, for example, um, and servers and that kind of stuff you can do with anything really i use windows for all my development and um but i don't do iphone apps or any mac based products so i'm fine with that all right <clears throat> well there's but go to there's a lot of opinions about that so depending on who you ask you're gonna get very different responses <laughs> hardcore mac people are super mac it's like our, that, that you would just not. But I have to say, though, I'm also like a super Windows person. Like I cannot. When I open a Mac, I feel like 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 a like a like an old person. Like, oh, what is it? Oh, what is this? Oh, you can't click here. It's, it's, it's terrible. My partner only has Mac products and I, for the love of me, I cannot. <laughs> I cannot touch them. I can barely open my laptops. Anyway, less cranking. Okay, so what was I? Yeah, lists as inputs. <clears throat> uh, Uh, okay, I'm reading my notes about how I was going to do this. Item access and after B rep over a collection of curves. Difference between I and this and that. Okay, yeah. I see. Mm hmm. All right. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So let me open one of the previous examples. Then that's going to be advanced geometry. I had a surface, right? Oh, no, I didn't initial. Oh, OK. Scripting with geometry. Uh, now I'm going to do E3. So I'm going to copy this. What? Ugh. Okay. I'm going to copy this. Uh, all right. Okay. I pasted it a bunch of times. Okay. <clears throat> um. I have a surface here and then um, I'm going to this for example I'm 
going to subdivide in two. And I have, so I have this here. And then for H, and then I'm going to print here to the console. And then, yes, and then I change the list, and then I change to three. Okay. Okay, I think that should be good. <laughs> Well, I think Microsoft launched Windows 11 because they wanted to um, have people log into their Microsoft accounts to use Windows, which I find extremely bad. I don't know why I need to log into any service to use my own computer, but whatever. Um, but to justify it with the Windows subsystem, Linux, whatever, that was it's in Windows, 10 already, but I think they improved it in Windows 11. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of, of Windows 11 at this point. Anyways, so what are we doing? So in this video, I would like to talk about the different access that we have to data. And I would like to link that to the behavior of Grasshopper components. Um, so for example, this is going to be, I'm going to, <clears throat> it's going to the behavior of grasshopper components and, um, the behavior of grasshopper components. And then I would like to talk about lists and then I would like to make a few examples of how to work with lists. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's try that. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to cover the idea of using lists of data or using data trees. Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> going again, again, again. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to teach you how to go beyond what we have learned so far in this series, which is how to work with individual units of data coming in to Grasshopper components, and then how to work with streams of data or with multiple units of information. I would like to focus specifically on how Grasshopper components deal with the execution of streams of incoming data. And I would like to do some examples about how to work with lists of data in particular as inputs. And let me show you what I mean with streams of data and how Grasshopper handles this, whatever. What we have done so far is that we know how to create a Grasshopper component, right? We know how to say, well, the input here has to be of the type 0.3D, whatever. And then if I double click here, you can see that my component now takes one point as an input and then takes, uh, spits out something over the output A. Right. And then if I were, if, if I were to plug in to this component, a wire con containing a data structure, such as this one, uh, which is a grasshopper data tree, it has branches, it has list, and it has three items per list. 
If I were to do that, something very interesting will happen. The component has no code whatsoever right now, but we can see that the component is already doing something. And very interestingly, is outputting a data structure that has the same structure as the original that we're uh, inputting here. Why is that happening? How is that happening? I have not written a single line of code in the Grasshopper component. How, how on, earth, on earth is this then happening like this? Well, it turns out that Grasshopper has a very, very specific way of how it handles data, that, how it handles inputs that have not just one element, but multiple elements. And the idea is that we can control the behavior of the component depending on the type of data that we are receiving. So for example, the default is that grasshopper components work with individual units of data. What that means is that if I say nothing, this component, which is working with each one of the points, what it's going to do is that it's going to execute one time for each one of these elements that are coming in. And then it's going to output the results of that operation for each one of the items in the same structure as it was given it as an input. So, for example, if I have nine points divided in three lists and three branches in a data tree, then this component is going to take each one of those components and it's going to execute this function, the run script function, for each one of the points individually. All right? And the result of that operation, whatever we output for A, so for example, A equals, hey, I made a calculation. Then each one of those is going to be output in a mirroring structure to the one that was given as an input. So I, if I give it more points, then more strings are going to be output. But if I give it less, then less strings are going to be output. I am not writing in this component a for loop anywhere that is outputting like lists of data. But because the component by default is set to only work with each one of the elements at a time, then that's why the output is nine different messages, each one of them corresponding to the nine different input points that I have here in my component, all right? And I'm going to maximize this because we know that there's a surface that it gets subdivided so let's just make this a little larger. That default behavior is what's called item access and is the default in C sharp script components, for example. However, that can be changed. The idea is that when I right click here, we've gone a little over this section here that defines what kind of access we want to have to the data that is coming in. Do we want to just make the component work with each one of the items individually? Or do we want the component to work with the lists that are coming in? Or do we want the component to work with the whole data tree at once? All right. How do we want that? Well, right now, because we have item access, we can see that inside the input P is a single point 3D object. But look at what's going to happen. If I were to click here and change to list access, what would happen would be that my input is not a point 3D object anymore. Now, Grasshopper has automatically turned it into a list of points. And very interestingly, because this data tree contains three lists of points, then this component doesn't execute nine times anymore. It executes three times, which, are the, the, which is the amount of lists that I have in this data tree and I get a data tree that has the same structure, but no elements. And I don't know what is going on with this. Um, I don't know what's going on with this, okay? Does that make sense? All right, and actually I'm kind of curious about what's going on here. So what if I do that? And then what, why cannot A be a, a message here? Okay, so that was, I don't, I really don't understand what was going on. Hey, I made a calculation. All right. So you can see 
Now the component has executed three times. Maybe it would be clearer if I have a different number of elements here. So yes, so more lists with less elements. You can see this data tree now has four, now has five lists with two elements each. So now on the tree, because we have five lists, this component has executed five times instead of 10, which is the number of elements that we have here. Correct? Does this make sense? But that also means that now, if I were to write code inside of my component, I would have a list with these two points, then it would run again with a list of these two points, it would run again with a list of these two points, and these two points here. If I knew how to work with data tree, which is what we're going to do in the next video, then what I could do is I could say, well, instead of list, just give me the whole thing, all right? Just give me the whole thing. And if you do, then I'm going to, I don't know, I don't know why that fails. But what you can see is that now, because it's taken the whole com data tree as an input, so it's not a list anymore, it's a data tree. The data tree is the whole thing, the whole chunk itself. And because it's taken the whole list, the whole data tree of information, that's why the component now only runs one time, because it's given all the information at once, all right? Does this make sense? This is very interesting. Grasshopper manages all of this for us. We don't need to care about triggering the component several times or feeding in the information. That is one of the nice things that we have when we script inside of Grasshopper, that this component somehow, the Grasshopper engine handles the execution of this component four times, one time with the data tree, with the list, whatever that is. It takes the data, it crunches it, and the only thing that we need to take care of is saying, I want to work with each one of the elements, or I want to work, I want to work with lists of elements, or I want to work with the whole data tree at once. Yeah, I am going to select that behavior here, and then Grasshopper will take care of managing the rest, the executions, the list, etc., etc. So this is extremely important because it's fundamental to how Grasshopper works. And then, because also, and also is it very important because very often ourselves, we will not, we will need to work with data that is more than just individual units. We will need to create, for example, geometry based on collections of data, like interpolating a curve over a series of points, like we did in the exercise number three, or interpolating or lofting a surface over a set of curves, which is what we're going to do in this video. Okay, so let me show you a couple examples of applications that could be useful for um, uh, for applications that can be useful if instead of working with item elements, we work with lists as inputs. Oh, wow, I'm very... Uh, Okay. So, all right. So what are we going to do then? We're going to, I'm going to save this file, first of all. And then I'm going to create a series. I'm going to create a series. Oh, I need to add 3.3 to nurse. Oh. Add. Okay, so I, I just remember I forgot to do something. So, um, for example, start in value, going to be this one, step size, it's going to be whatever, and this is going to be this. And, and this is going to be, Okay, 
So yeah, just for example, this. So for example, the first example is going to be extremely straightforward, it's going to be given a list of numerical values, calculating the average of all those values. So how can we do that? I have a C sharp script component here that I already tune and I changed the name with the paint bucket to average. I, it has one input that is called S, so it's going to be a series of numbers, and it has an output that is called AVG, the average, okay? So and the first thing that I need to do is I need to remember to type the input and to make it a double because it can take any kind of number. And the other thing that I would like to do is to remind us that if I leave it like that, we're not going to be able to calculate the average of anything because we're going to be given single numbers per instance of the script running. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that instead of one value, as an input, I have a list of values as an input. And that we're going to do by right clicking here and typing list access. And then as I do that, you can see that now the input has changed from one single double to a list of doubles as an input. If I plug this in here now and I copy this, I can probably now start writing my code. So as we typically do, my algorithm, my outputs and the algorithm, um, I, you probably know this if you are familiar with C sharp scripting. What we're going to do is we're going to add all the numbers together and we're going to divide the result of that addition by the number of elements that we have. So we're going to start by the addition. We're going to uh, create a variable called sum, which we're going to start by zero. And then we're going to iterate over the list. So int i equals zero, i is less than the amount of elements on the list i plus plus and then what we're going to do here we could have also iterated with a for each that's absolutely fine too and we're going to say sum we need to increase it by the value of s in position y so each one of the elements one at a time and then the average is going to be equal to the sum of those values divided by how many numbers did we have on the list all right and then I'm going to, yeah, average. And then here, the output AVG, that's the output of the component, is going to be equal to the average value, okay? So how does that work? Well, um, we have this value. I actually kind of not, don't have a way to compare in this. Uh, there's a, I believe there's a component in Grasshopper that does means, let me, let me double check. All right, can someone help me? Is there a grasshopper component to calculate averages or means or something like that? Is that a thing? I forget. Ah, uh, the average, no? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, yes. All right. Oh, 
Oh yes, I found it, sorry. It was under maths, utilities, there's an average component here. And then what we can do is we can plug this in here and double check and yes, it basically we had the right result, okay? So that's great, for example, uh, but again, the most important part here is that we were able, if we had had this as item access, you can see that oh, we cannot work because we don't have a list, it's just single units, and that the component runs once for each one of the inputs. So it will be running one for each one of the, so we cannot, we need to be able to look at the list as a whole, not at each one of the elements individually, all right? Okay, so let's see a very similar example. Let me put this back to work. Let's see a very similar example about how to take a collection of curves and loft a surface uh, through those curves. <clears throat> and here we have lock options closed, not closed, she seems revealed the fit tolerance. Normal. All right. And let me look up before I get into. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kartik. Create from loft. No curves. Uh, start tangent and start end. This is a simpler one. Loft type and closed. And then if I let loft, all right, mm -hmm. okay, so we like that, okay, <clears throat> so, and then, and then here, uh, all right, and then laugh. <clears throat> Let's get hands on. So I have drawn in Rhino three curves that are in three dimensional space. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on curve, set multiple curves and bring them all in. I have connected a native loft component that you can see is generating this B rep through the set of curves. And of course, if I, if I change any of the original ones, if I change any of the original ones, then the component, everything updates correspondingly, right? And then, uh, generates that B rep. And then I have also dropped a C sharp script component that I have already renamed and I uh, used the paint bucket. The input is called C, the output is called L. And I need to remember to say that the input needs to be of the type curve 
and where am I? It needs to be the type curve that is right over here. And I should move myself to the other side at some point, right? <laughs> this is getting bad. I should, this is curve. And then I also need to remember that if I start working with the component right away, my input will be single curves. And in order to make the loft, I need to be able to look at the full list of curves as a whole. So that's why I need to right click here and click on list access so that I have now access to the full list of curves. Okay. Beautiful. And once we have, are here, now what we need to figure out is how to loft a curve, how to loft a B rep through a set of curves. So how do we do that? Well, we either know how to do that or we explore the autocomplete or we can start with the documentation, which is typically a good place to start. So I'm going to type here loft in the documentation and see what comes up. And I can see that there's a bunch of brep.create from loft methods that look promising to me. So because what I want is a brep created from a loft method. So I'm going to click here and you can see that there the create from loft method has two overloads. The one that I landed in has a lot of information, tangents, brep, trims, whatever. Maybe this one is a little too much. Let me try the other one. The other one looks a little better, a little, because create from loft, it takes an input, it takes an enumerable of curves, so something that can iterate over curves, or a list, an array, whatever, so it takes a bunch of curves. Then it takes two points, the start and the end points, I'm not sure what that means. Let me look at the documentation. Optional starting point for a loft. Oh, interesting, I didn't know I could choose points for the beginning or the end of the loft. Honestly, I'm not sure what that really means, but it looks like if you don't want to include that start point, you can just use point3d.unset. All right, so it turns out that this is optional, so maybe it's not, I'm not bothering too much with that. Loft type will tell me which type of loft do I want to perform, which looks like one of the options that I have here in the vanilla version, loft type here, which can be normal, loose, tight, straight, uniform. And as I can see, it's of, the loft, it's of the type loft type, which if I click here, I can see that it's an enumeration. So I can choose between normal, loose, tight, etc., etc., and then um, And then just um, choose what kind of shape the B rep fits through those curves. And then last but not least, a Boolean, whether if I want the last curve to be connected to the first one or not. So this one looks very doable to me. A couple of things that I would like to note from the documentation is that, first of all, this is a static method. So I will be calling it, as we have seen before, from the brep class. So brep.create from loft. The other thing that I would like to highlight is that what it's giving me back is not one brep. It's giving me an array of breps. This is because, as we have seen in the past, if the curves are all one after the other, very clean, etc., very likely the result will be just one brep. But if they're intersecting and if there's like messiness with the original curves, maybe the result is actually several split brep's uh, with no continuity. So the solver will be the one who will decide that for us. So I think this method is quite doable and it's the one that I'm going to um, that I'm going to implement. So let's do it. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to plug in the curves and I don't know what this is, blah, blah, blah. So I think it just, it's just getting confused. All right. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to say brep dot and I'm going to create from loft. That's what it was that we did, right? Create from, what is loft? Create from loft. All right. I'm going to do that. I open parentheses. And then the first input is the list of curves. So that's going to be C. The second point is the start point. Remember that that was optional. And it said, the documentation said that if we didn't want to use it, just set it to point 3D unset. This is because, as I explained in my previous video, I believe, point 3D is a struct and structs, struct types cannot be null. So Rhino gives us this special point that is almost as a, as a null point. It's called the unset, so that you can define a point that doesn't really exist, 
but you can feed it to places where they need points. So that's why I'm going to say point 3D dot onset. All right. And that's going to be for the start point. I'm going to do another one for the end point. So that was onset. Then the next parameter is the loft type. All right. For the time being, I'm going to hard code it. So it's going to be loft type normal, for example. And then the last one is going to be whether if I want it close or not. For this one, I'm going to say false. All right. And that's it, I think. Now, remember that this method returns uh, a, an array of B reps, right? So I'm going to have to catch the return of this into a variable. B rep array uh, lofts is going to be equal to all this stuff here. And because I'm out of space, I'm going to be just entering here some kind of um, new line character. And then the, the output L is going to be equal to those that array that I just said. Let's try this. Whoa, whoa, boom, whoa, it works. And it looks like it is overlapping with the original one, which means that I think we did a good job. All right. But um, at this point, we're a bit more refined uh, parametric designers, computational designers. So I would like to not have hard coded stuff here. I don't like hard coding. So can we add inputs to this component for the loft type and for the periodicity? Is that something we can do? I believe we can. So let's say loft type, that's going to be T and uh, periodic, is it close? That's going to be P. The loft type is going to be of the type integer. Remember, enums are represented by numbers, so we can convert from numbers, integers very easily to enums. And P is going to be whether if it's periodic or not, that's going to be Boolean. And because we want the same parameter for all the curves, that's why these are going to remain item and these are also going to remain item. Well, with that, we can probably now plug in here a couple sliders. So for example, I'm going to plug in here an integer slider for the type and we I'm also going to plug in here so that we have the same and a Boolean toggle. Ooh, it's been a long day. Uh, and a Boolean toggle for the periodic or periodic or whether if it's closed, which I believe is this one right here. Okay, a closed loft. All right, so if I turn this on, then the original, now it's a closed loft. And if I move this, you see number one is a loose fit. So you see it's very different. So let's try to replicate all of this in our components. So let's try to replicate first the type of loft. So as we saw in previous videos, what we can do is we can say loft type loft LT is going to be equal to casting to loft type to casting the value that is coming for T, all right? And then instead of love type normal, we will use here LT. If I do that, you can see that now the two B reps, the one from the top and the one from the bottom are both uh, matching, okay? So that's great. So we have um, the type also control. And then the last thing we want is, well, this parameter, which is going to be super easy. So here P, which is defining whether it fits periodic or not, Instead of the hard code, we just plug it in right away. And then close, not close. Normal, loose, developable, blah, 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 whatever. So, boop, boop. all right. So it looks like this is working as well. Okay. Beautiful. So with this, I think these two examples covered well the idea of defining components that instead of taking single inputs, they take lists of data as inputs so that internally we can operate with the whole list at once. And this will be very helpful for operations like we have seen, lofting over a bunch of curves, calculating stuff based on a list of numbers, generating geometry that interpolates or flows through many other geometries, etc., etc. The sky is the limit at this point. All right. Beautiful. 
With this, I think that's all I wanted to say for this video. Um, I believe in the next video, we're going to take a look at the other data structure that we can work with, which is data trees, which is specifically for Grasshopper. Okay, and then after that, we may just do another, another batch of exercises. All right. Thank you very much. If you like what you saw, consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications, giving a comment, saying hi on Discord, uh, sharing a story, reposting, uh, you know, modern 21st century social media kind of stuff. All right. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Bye. All righty. Okay, that was a lot. Let me write here. Uh, I think this was fine. Oh. <clears throat> How's everyone doing? Hey, Valentin. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Um, where are you calling it from, Valentin? Argentina, Uruguay, Chile. Hmm? Okay, so, all right, let me clean this up a little bit. Let me clean this up and save it. And let me, before I forget, um, I wrote in my notes here that in nurse geometry, I actually have to add the files that we did, the examples that we did in 3.3. So, uh, so that would be this one. So this is Okay, so blend curve. All right, I'm going to I'm going to finish this off, but I think I'm going to call it a day because I've been talking for four and a half hours today. So if you have any questions, you want to do Q and A, social, whatever, feel free to post on the chat. Otherwise, I'll guess I'll see you. I'm going to finish this off, and I'll see you on the next live stream. Which, as usual, I don't really know when it's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, right, so that's going to be, and this is going to be four point surface, four point surface, and then here, B rep plane intersection. All right, and I'm going to load this file here. Wait, wait, wait cancel and wait, wait, wait. So did I interiorize? Did I internalize this? I didn't. You see? Okay. Um, I'm going to save this, save this. I'm going to load this file. I'm going to internalize all of this. Internalize data, internalize data. Uh, internalized it. Um, mm -hmm. Internalized it. Um, and then internalize all of this. I guess I want to. Okay, I guess I want to just place this here somewhere that makes sense. All right. So. Um, okay, and I don't need this. 
and then I also don't need this and I also don't want this yeah I want this Mm hmm maybe this one goes here and maybe this one goes over here how about that mm -hmm. okay I'm very tired it's a beautiful day here in Cambridge in Boston I think I'm going to go out for a run I'm doing um I'm doing a 10k training thing on an app it's kind of cool Oh, I'm liking it a lot. Oi. Oi. All right. Mm. And then this is done. I don't need to. And there's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. And at this point, all right, I think we're good. Ah, thank you, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be with all of you and um, I'm happy that this is coming along I'm actually quite happy so um, we still have a few videos to go but I think we're kind of halfway through the list in a way sort of I think <laughs> hopefully <laughs> Uh, but yes, so, um, all right. Thank you very much, everyone. If there's no questions or Q and A, I'm going to call it a day and I'm going to go out and have some fun in the real world in the form of a run. No. Thank you. Have a good one and see you very soon. Bye bye.